This summer, as Catholics across the country stand up for their religious liberty, we thought it might be nice to feature bookmarked episodes from years past that deal with the faith of our founders and the first of our First Amendment rights. We hope you enjoy the following interview from our archives. And welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our special guest is Archbishop Charles Chaput, Capuchin Franciscan. His work is Render Unto Caesar, published by Doubleday. It is a supreme pleasure to have you on the program. For me, here, an honor. Thank you. Here, Bishop, uh, on EWTN's Bookmark. I did have the pleasure one time of interviewing you on your earlier book a number of years ago, but we right. unfortunately did that via satellite. We weren't even in the same room at the same time. And actually, I had the pleasure of meeting you really back in 1997 before you went to Denver. And I will say I had the pleasure of producing actually your installation mass in wow. Denver. So, Thank you for uh, doing that. You've done wonderful things for me. No, you've done wonderful things for the church and certainly uh, for supporting EWTN as a member of the board. I'm, I'm uh, honored and proud of that. Uh, of EWTN. Now, I remember when we did that interview. I remember talking to you about, you know, maybe doing a TV series or are you going to write any other books? And you were like, no, I'm not writing any other books. Right. What changed? Uh, I think two things changed. One, uh, time passed and you forget the pain. You know, like a mother who gives birth to a child, <laughs> okay. you forget the pain. But secondly, I think the issue of faith and politics is so important mm -hmm. that I needed to try to uh, do something. This is kind of like a, uh, an introduction to the basic issues around faith and politics and why it's important for Catholics as a matter of their Catholic identity to be involved in the political life of their country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the subheading is serving the nation by living our Catholic beliefs in political life. Now, render unto Caesar, famous statement from, right. our, from our Lord. Was that the title you came up with or did the publisher come no, up with it was my that? title mm -hmm. because I wanted, to, I wanted to say basically that uh, we should render to Caesar what belongs to him, but not very much belongs to him. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And uh, all the rest belongs to God. So. To, to render to God the things belong to God is really what this book's about. Mm -hmm. uh, James T. McHugh, bishop and friend, right. you dedicated to his memory. Right, Bishop Jimmy McHugh. He was the um, bishop of Camden uh, when I met him. He and I were ordained bishops about the same time. He was quite a bit older than I was. But at the bishop's conference, he had an uh, ability to speak honestly and clearly on all the issues that many of the rest of us danced around. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought he was a tough guy. Mm -hmm. I didn't especially find him friendly when I first met him because okay. he was so tough. But as uh, time went on, I saw his tender side right. and uh, valued, very much valued his tough side. He was able to speak the gospel without fear. Great pro-life leader. Yeah, great pro-life leader. I remember when he was named to the Diocese of Rockville Center, people were cheering. And well, then unfortunately, it wasn't long after that. Well, he died within a year or two after right. being there. Right. But he was one of my heroes. He and Cardinal O'Connor died the same year about the same time, and that's two of my heroes yeah, went to two God. Two of the great pro-life leaders. That's really, right. In, that's in right. The church. Now, the beginning here, you have two quotes. One focuses on courage, and one focuses on love. Right. I, I think those are two essential elements of why we become involved in the political issues of our country. Mm -hmm. um, without love, uh, there's no real democracy, because democracy is a, about equals who care for one another, working for the common good. And without courage, uh, it's difficult to, to do the kind of battles we need mm -hmm. to do to protect human dignity and to the common good. Mm -hmm. So I think those, in, in some ways, are the foundational mm -hmm. uh, virtues that undergird a strong commitment to political life. Mm -hmm. Now, w at the very beginning of the book, starting at the source, you say you wrote this book for two reasons. Uh, the first is a simple one. A friend asked you to do it, which you can talk a little bit about. Mm -hmm. a and later on, you, you t talk about the second reason is more personal. Let's talk about the first reason. Well, I have a good friend who was running for office uh, as a Democrat in a Republican district in Colorado. Uh, what was unique about him was that he was a pro-life Democrat. And he found out in the course of running that uh, he wasn't getting the money that uh, other members of his party were getting. And, uh, they didn't exactly shun him, but they didn't support him in the same kind of positive, active way. Uh, he lost the election, but not very, very, by very much. So I th think he had a sense that you could be a pro-life Democrat and still possibly win, especially since he did so well in a uh, Republican district. Um, but he's, after he ran and experienced the difficulties of running, he said, why don't you write a book about oh, Catholics really? and politics? Mm -hmm. and because he realized how tough it was. Now you go to say that uh, you thought living the gospel of life, the 1998 document, 
was a wonderful document to begin with. Right. So you thought something really was out there already. Right. And it, it was a document that we bishops had written, approved, but wasn't very much uh, quoted either, either by the bishops or by the mm -hmm. broader uh, Catholic community. So in some ways, this book is a, an expansion upon that. Right. Uh, well, you mentioned that the, the, the 98 document, though it had to survive a great deal of internal friction and wrangling first. Right, that's right, because of the reason it was, it, there was a great argument about it is it's very concrete, and it challenges uh, Catholics who are running for office, who are already in office, to be Catholic before they're members of their party or anything else. And it also encourages Catholics who are voters, and that should be all of us, to apply our Catholic principles concretely in all the elections. With the friction and the response to this, is it harder in a sense, is that pushback more from the politicians, or in a sense the resistance from the clergy or the hierarchy who now feel that they're obligated to do something that might be uncomfortable? Uh, I think both. I, I think that uh, there's a sense that you can alienate uh, people who disagree with you by being too clear. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's, there's a desire to have access to political leaders because they can do very good things for the church. So there's a hesitation on the part of, uh, of church leaders, I think, to be absolutely clear on these matters. Um, you, I have many people who, among the faithful who write to me who are in some sense committed to their parties uh, more clearly than they are to where the church stands. Mm -hmm. And so there's pushback from voters. And it, to me it, it's Im very important for us if we're going to be Catholics, whether we're politicians or simply good citizens who vote, to see ourselves as Catholics before anything else and that the, the highest uh, responsibility we have is to be faithful to the teachings mm -hmm. of Jesus. Yeah, and you talk later in the book about uh, one of the, was it, the, one of the uh, great bishops uh, and also uh, John Courtney Murray and, uh, and things. Because do you think there was a, a period of time where, you know, Catholics made uh, an attempt to make sure it was American before Catholic because they were looked at in a Protestant country suspiciously? I think, I think it's always our temptation. Even in my own experience, I'm 63 years old, I've been a priest for nearly 40 years. Um, when I was younger, uh, it was kind of the expectation we would have peace with our culture, that mm -hmm. Catholics really fit in. And I think we worked hard at that. And when I was a young man, there was very little overt anti-Catholic sentiment in our country. That was in the 1950s and into the early 60s. And as we've uh, found ourselves in a culture that isn't as friendly to where the church stands, uh, we've experienced uh, an alienation of the mm -hmm. culture uh, to, to the teachings of Jesus and to the church. And so I think it's harder to be a Catholic today and to be clearly uh, committed uh, to that and run for office or um, be active in, a, in party politics. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, as, as time's go, gone on, it, there's a kind of a, a renewed sense that it's difficult to be a Catholic in our culture. Right. And I would think uh, that they say in politics because it's all about money and raising money, and it takes a lot of money in an age where media is a big part of right. getting well, I, I don't think it's elected. just about money. It's, it's usually about money, but it's also, you have to be nominated by your party. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be nominated by your party, you have to be friendly to those who are most active in, in the party. I see, right. To attract the money, you also have to have a certain kind mm -hmm. of positions. But I think even to be nominated before raising the money, mm -hmm. there has to be a certain um, sympathy on your part with your party. Right. And unfortunately, that doesn't always work when it comes to Catholic principles. Right. Now, uh, and you mentioned in the book clearly, you know, we're Catholics, we're not uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans, and, and that's what your point clearly is in the book. And one of the things, you know, we always hear because people, and you go into in detail, you know, in the book, but talking about issues, and you say some issues have more gravity than others. Some methods to achieve a good end are wrong in themselves, because that's one of the things we hear you know, the whole idea of, you know, in a sense weighing, well, peace and justice versus pro-life abortion, stem cell, how do I balance those? Or can I balance those and say they're the same? Well, I think we have to think about them. We have to think seriously about them. There's no easy answer. And I think if you try to, to come up with a shortcut to um, dealing with these issues, you're, not, you're betraying your vocation as a, a Catholic. But there's, there's an example that I'd like to use in explaining uh, why those who, who stand strongly on life issues aren't simply single issue voters. Okay. A friend of mine and his wife um, were telling me that uh, when they look for someone to be a babysitter for their children, um, there isn't just one quality they look for. Mm -hmm. But there are some qualities that would exclude someone. 
Uh, for example, if, if, they, if the potential babysitter were a pedophile, no matter how good they were on other issues, right. they would never hire that person as a babysitter. So I mean, there are some issues that are more important and more foundational, but they're not the only issues. And, and when it comes to the protection of unborn human life, uh, the protection of the elderly, uh, the dignity of their life too, and the ill, uh, then I think that uh, there's some, these are some issues that you just never go with someone who stands uh, clearly on the other side of the issue. Mm -hmm. Now you say if this book does nothing more than lead more people to read and act on living the gospel life, it will have partly served its purpose. Now you said the other second reason for writing this book, as I alluded to, was personal. And down further you say, I've grown increasingly tired of the church and her people being told to be quiet on public issues. Worse, Catholics themselves too often stay silent out of a misguided sense of good manners. Even those of us who are bishops can sometimes see more concern with discretion and diplomacy than speaking plainly and acting clearly. Right. We we're frightened by those who yell at us, separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is a foundational uh, reflection of our country. But what that means is that the state won't tell the church what to do, and the church shouldn't be telling uh, the state the details of uh, legislation. Uh, but, but I think many people use uh, that uh, to, to, to defend themselves because they're really afraid to take stands that are unpopular. Um, there's a difference between separation of church and state and a separation of faith and politics. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can never, politics is about the way you treat people. It's about the values you try to um, enshrine in the way we relate. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really about love. It's about caring for your neighbor. So how could there be any real separation of faith and politics, mm -hmm. even if you want to separate church and state. You say party loyalty is a dead end. It's a lethal form of laziness. Absolutely. Issues matter, character matters. Absolutely. But it's interesting, why did you say this book will not feed anyone's nostalgia for a Catholic golden age? Well, there never was a Catholic golden age, okay. I don't think. Um, we often think about that. You know, when people say, well, we could solve the problems in the church today if we just went back to the Latin Mass. Um, well, there were there were problems in the past when we church celebrated the Tridentine form of the Mass. And uh, many of the people who um, led the church in a different direction were actually formed in those earlier days by that environment. Uh, many people don't like where the, where the church has been led by those folks. And so to think that there was a time when um, we didn't, when things were easier, when, when a system um, took care of everything, mm -hmm. it's wrong. We have to think and act in our time on the knowledge that we have with the courage that Jesus gives us. You also say here, people usually assume that popes and all pastors have far more quote unquote power over events than they actually do. Is, is that something you yourself have personally experienced? I've experienced it. You know, when I was a, a young person, I would think that an archbishop in the church would have hugely significant says in all kinds of things. And having become an archbishop, I find that I really, I mean, I have, the, I have a, a, a pulpit that gives me access to people and people have a natural respect for the clergy and for bishops. But in terms of really moving things along, uh, whether it's in the church or outside the church, um, I don't I don't know um, that it's easier for me to do that than it would be for someone else. Mm -hmm. And you also point out that this book doesn't offer any grand theory, should it? Or is that what people well, it's expect? It's not a grand theory, but there is a theory, and the theory is that we should become involved, and the gospel requires of it of us. But I don't have a, a strategy. I don't present a strategy there on how people can do that concretely. Mm -hmm. It really requires thought, reading, involvement, commitment, mm -hmm. dealing with difficulties, pushback, you know, and, and being faithful to Christ and, and faithful to your love for your neighbor through the whole process. Mm -hmm. Now you point out and you talk about the separation of church and state and you kind of talk about the, the real meaning and the history, etc. You go back and relate to a little bit of that. But you talk about the idea of respect really being more like revering in the sense that it's almost a religious situation the way it's proposed by some people, right, this separation. Right, well, some people, I think people who generally talk about that with a great deal of uh, enthusiasm are really telling the church to be quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, depending on where you stand on, on, on issues, you draw the line differently when it comes to separation of church and state. For example, many people in our community in Denver uh, who um, are on the liberal side of things, are always upset when the church, or when I speak about the life issues, abortion, and running stem cell research and the like, and they say that you should be quiet. That's a, that's a religious matter and shouldn't be part of the public discussion. Mm -hmm. Those who 
um, the same folks will be very, very complimentary of me when I speak about uh, issues of immigration mm -hmm. and respect for the for immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, but they're but they're both public policy issues, mm -hmm. you know, and that they're both about the human dignity, human dignity, and the common good. That have and to be informed by our faith. They right? have to be informed by our faith, and so the church naturally is involved in all those issues. And it, there's no logic to say I should be silent on some of them and be loud or be active on others. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the other side, the conservative side, you know, pat me on the back and, and thank me for my activity on abortion issues, but they, t they tell me they're not going to give any money to the church because where I stand on immigration issues. So it's a, it's a strange world in which we live. Mm -hmm. And what I really call for is, is reflection and consistency in the way we apply the principles of the gospel to our time. Right, and we've got to remember to remain generous as we're orthodox, right? Absolutely. Okay. You say, any notion of tolerance that tries to reduce faith to a private idiosyncrasy or a set of opinions that we can indulge at home but need to be quiet about in public will always fail. As a friend once said, it's like asking a married man to act single in public. He can certainly do that, but he won't stay married very long. That's exactly right. You know, We are who we are, whether we're in our home or in the public square and we shouldn't be embarrassed about where, what we really believe and who we are. Mm -hmm. Another point that I, I, I don't know if you're going to bring this up later, but one of the, the, the issues I, I talk about in the book is that tolerance is not a Christian virtue. You know, it comes from Latin words, means to bear the burden, mm -hmm. and to bear the burden of someone else and tolerate somebody else isn't a, a very positive kind of uh, way of relating. I think we have to tolerate our differences, mm -hmm. but we don't we love one another, we don't tolerate uh, one another. Right. So, d you know, d d okay. to praise tolerance as a, should be one of the principal virtues of life in America. Well, it seems to be the highest virtue. Well, it, it, that's what some people say, but... Uh, but, but the same people want you to want tolerate to to one thing, won't tolerate... They don't want me, they don't want to tolerate where I stand, right, they want right. me to tolerate where they stand. Right. Know. Yeah. Well, you talk about in, the, in this chapter here, um, a little bit about the consumer economy makes life easier. It also turns appetites into needs. Uh, and that something in American life really has changed. It's become more vulgar, more callous. Over the past few decades, our civic vocabulary has coarsened. I thought this was interesting. An overfed understanding of our personal rights and individual freedom has squeezed out the responsibility and decorum we owe to each other. And uh, so we're kind of like Visigoths, modern day Visigoths. Well, right. Yeah, uh, you know, I say, I just say things in a in a um, creative way sometimes in order to get people's attention. Um, but one of the things that I worry about is uh, whether or not we, as a nation, are as committed to the virtue of patriotism as we were when I was when I was a young boy. Um, it was always put on the same level as our love for our family. Filial piety and patriotism were two virtues that went together. I don't know that love for our country. Is a, re, is a um, respected quality anymore, let alone perceived as a Christian virtue. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, it, what it really means, patriotism means that we love our neighbors mm -hmm. and that we'll actually embody that in our public relationships and we'll build a culture that encourages that kind of love and respect. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I think it's a question generally asked throughout our society today, are our young people taught patriotism, or is it kind of laughed at as an old-fashioned virtue? Right, in the post-Vietnam world. That's right. I but think. it isn't only because of the experience of Vietnam, it's also because we're taught to take care of ourselves today. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, we're, we're, it's all about me right. rather than about us. The idea that you would go and sacrifice yourself Sac for this. Risk your life even right. for your neighbor is foolishness unless you really believe mm -hmm. that that's how God made us, to love one another in that kind of radical way. Right, right. Now, you, you use this phrase, I guess it's from C.S. Lewis here, men without chests. Right. Why did you bring that up? Well, chests, you know, it's a symbol of having a heart and a symbol of courage, you know. Men who have chests are men who are strong and who are committed and who are courageous. And, uh, you know, the, the, our chest is where our heart is. It's, a, it's about substance. And it, it seems to me, uh, again, there's a temptation in our present time, in our present culture, not to not to value those virtues mm -hmm. of, of courage and care for others and to be just centered in ourselves. Mm -hmm. You say, as Catholics, how can we uncouple what we do from what we claim to believe without killing what we believe and in lying in what we do? How can we? Right. You know, it seems to me that uh, you prove uh, what you say by what you do. Mm -hmm. 
And if you uh, say things that you don't do, you're a hypocrite and a liar. Mm -hmm. Why do you say that history never really repeats itself? Well, it never does because uh, uh, patterns repeat themselves, but each one of us is unique. We've never existed before. No one will be like us in the future. Uh, we believe in, I believe people make a difference. We turn history, you know, so we, although we have the same temptations as our ancestors, we don't have to give in to them mm -hmm. and we can go a different way. So I think the patterns repeat themselves, but not, not, not necessarily the results, because we can be more courageous and more committed than those who've gone before us. Uh, at the end of chapter three, you say, we can choose our side. We can't choose not to choose. Not choosing is a choice. I remember, I don't know if it was Bobby Kennedy or somebody right. had kind of made that a popular right. expression. Right. To sit back and to do nothing, uh, not to choose, means that the things that God expected us to do or planned for us to do don't get done. Mm -hmm. And that means that the history of salvation, you know, the plan that God had for the history of salvation is marred by our failure to, to shoulder our responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Chapter four, Constantine's children. You talk about two bishops. One is an Archbishop Joseph Rummel uh, from New Orleans. And the other one is actually Archbishop Raymond Burke of St. Louis. Right. How, why did you link those well, two together? Well, yeah, I remember uh, Archbishop Rummel's decision to integrate the Catholic schools in Louisiana. And it was a very, very difficult decision at that time. That was the big old social issue of the day. You know, the church finally uh, was enthusiastically involved on the side of integration. And this bishop made courageous decisions that were not accepted by many of his people. And he excommunicated, I think, three people who um, publicly and actively opposed the church's teaching on the dignity of all people and the evil of, of segregation. Uh, Archbishop Burke, and, and by the way, uh, Bishop Rumble was praised by the New York Times and, and much of the, what we would call the, the, the liberal media today uh, for his courage and his involvement. Archbishop Burke, um, before he moved from La Crosse to St. Louis, uh, was in dialogue with a number of Catholic politicians there who um, uh, really didn't respond appropriately to their, to their obligation to protect human life through legislation. And he, um, he excommunicated them, mm -hmm. told them they shouldn't receive communion. The same kind of folks that praised the action of Archbishop Rummel were very critical of the actions of Archbishop Burke. Mm -hmm. And I make the point, you know, I, I call it the tale of two bishops, right. how um, in one situation, the involvement of my church is praised, in another situation, because the elites don't agree w with the position of the church, is criticized. Right. And we can't let ourselves be governed by that. We have to be governed by truth and courage. Now, you talk about later on dealing with some of the hard issues related to, obviously, uh, things of, uh, pro-choice politicians, et cetera, and abortion. And one of the things we always hear, and you, you talk about it in this chapter, the idea of conscience. And, and you go, uh, as Cardinal Newman once said, the conscience has rights because it has duties. In Newman's words, we can believe what we choose. We are answerable for what we choose to believe because people say, well, my conscience is king. So if I've decided this is okay, in a sense, it's okay. But that's not right. No, it's not. But, you know, there's some truth to the fact that our conscience is king. We're, God expects us, finally, to follow our conscience. But conscience isn't simply what I personally naturally feel. It's, uh, it's a result of my uh, reflecting on the teachings of Christ and what he requires of me. And then, having come to know that truth, to choose it. And if I choose not to do the reflection, if I choose not to, to listen to the teachings of Christ as they come to us in the scriptures and the teachings of the church, if I choose to form my conscience by the voices of the contemporary world rather mm -hmm. than the voice of the Holy Spirit, then I've made a choice to, to go in the wrong direction. And I'm responsible for that. Mm -hmm. So. One of the tough ones, you said, my friends often ask me if Catholics in generally good conscience can vote for pro-choice candidates. The answer is, I couldn't. And, but you say, I do know sincere Catholics who reason differently. And, and this was an interesting, you said, one of the pillars of Catholic thought is this, don't deliberately kill the innocent and don't collude in allowing it. We sin if we support candidates because they support a false right to abortion. We sin if we support pro-choice candidates. Down further, you say, you talk about the whole idea of a proportionate reason. What does a proportionate reason look like when you're dealing with the killing of the unborn? It would be a reason we could, with an honest heart, expect 
that the unborn victims of abortion to accept when we meet them and need to explain our actions as we will someday. That's a great image. Um, I, I think it's very true. Um, you know, that in some ways, this is the biggest question in the book. I mean, what is the proportionate reason for voting uh, for someone who is pro-choice? And, you know, Catholics can never be pro-choice and be Catholic. I mean, they can't. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I have many really good Catholic friends who have decided to vote for somebody who is pro-choice, even though they have a possibility of voting for somebody who is, um, is pro-life. Um, I've never been able to understand the, uh, the rationale that they uh, go through, because I could never do that, except in a case where you have two bad choices, mm -hmm. and then, then you might have to choose a lesser of two evils. Right. But they very sincerely do this, and uh, some of them do it very thoughtfully, and, they very, and then they will do all they can to, to, to uh, find alternatives to abortion and can kind of convince their party that uh, where they stand, where the party stands is wrong, and they're, they're as active in, in opposing abortion within their parties as, as I would be, but nonetheless choose to vote for a different mm -hmm. candidate than I might in those same circumstances. Yeah. Um, what's a truly proportionate reason? It's hard to imagine anything proportionate to the million deaths by abortion in our country every year. And I think that um, we haven't been horrified enough by abortion. Our, uh, some, some, in some ways, the practice of it for so many years has kind of dulled us. And we, it's led many people to say, well, we can't do anything about this. Right. It's, it's not going to change. Well, it won't unless we get upset and right. do something about it. Um, you know, in the, uh, I think the Democrat Party platform uh, 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 embraces the woman's right to choose on, on the issue of abortion. Well, the, the, the largest number of Catholics belonged at one time to the Democrat Party, and they may still. Right. If those Catholics had spoken up loudly and clearly in those early days when the party was changing, you know, the party itself used to be pro-life and not pro-abortion. If Catholics had stood up and, and demanded that their party not stand there, it wouldn't have st stood there. Right. So we have a special obligation to do something about that today, to, to do our best to be insistent and try to change things. Well, we are proud to have you here speaking loudly out on this issue. Thank you so much, I'm happy Archbishop. To be here. Thanks. Keep up the wonderful work in Denver and throughout the United States and for the good of the church. Uh, talking here with Archbishop Charles Chaput, Capuchin Franciscan, his book, Render Unto Caesar, Serving the Nation by Living Our Catholic Beliefs in Political Life, published by Doubleday, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. You should read this book. I'm Doug Keck. Join us next time right here on Bookmark. Thank you.